Hi, I'm Maggie and you're watching The Darling M. Today we're going to talk about all or nothing fallacy and philosophy, particularly in regards to zero waste, but I would say it expands to all things sustainability, environmentalism, as well as veganism, social justice, any kind of activism or lifestyle choice. begin with quotation from an article by Madeline Somerville that appeared in The Guardian last year. So make sure you check my citations. So this article is called How I Deal with the Unbearable Hypocrisy of Being an Environmentalist. And she mentions that anytime someone takes a step towards sustainability, even if they're not doing it vocally, even if they just, you know, choose to bring a reusable bag to the grocery or anything that could be seen as green, that you are tacitly branding yourself. And this is, a, of course, a fear that people who aren't practicing sustainability have and prevents them from getting into the lifestyle, or even those of us who have kind of branded ourselves uh, openly and said that we're pro-sustainability, it kind of puts us at risk. She writes, by doing so, you open yourself to harsh criticism. You're asked to justify your decision to change anything when you're not committing to change everything. The fear of navigating this cognitive dissonance as well as the fear of armchair critics declaring that you failed is, I believe, at the heart of many people's reluctance to adopt more green practices. So I want to say you do not have to choose between all or nothing, and in fact that is a fallacy. Similarly, Zero Waste Chef in a great blog called How to Respond to Zero Waste Naysayers addresses this very thing and notes this same fallacious thinking of all or nothing. She writes, I think activism doesn't have to be an all or nothing proposition. Either you dedicate your life to the cause and give up everything, or you don't bother. And we see this everywhere. If someone is not willing to be the ideal example of what a sustainable person or a sustainable activist looks like or even what a vegan looks like or what a feminist looks like or what a social justice warrior looks like they choose instead the other extreme the other end of the spectrum of not getting involved at all so this all or nothing way of thinking is a combination of two fallacies ad hominem and false dichotomy. So when you overlap these fallacies of ad hominem and false dichotomy, you end up with a maxim called falsus in uno, falsus in omnibus, which means false in one thing, false in everything. And this developed as a Roman legal principle, it's Latin of course, and it was used to dismiss witnesses based on their character or if they had lied in one part of their testimony, they said, oh, if you lied about this one thing, we're going to disregard everything else you said, even the things that had a grain of truth in them. So let's look at the fallacy of a false dichotomy first. A false dichotomy is often uh, conflated with a false dilemma or, uh, in layman's terms, the either-or fallacy. So all or nothing is even phrased like an either-or fallacy. It is where one is presented with a binary of choices you are either this or this, you either vote for this person or you'll lose all your health care. You are either black or white, you are either man or woman. Spend all your money on palm oil free products or you're a terrible person, right? So they're presenting you with just two choices when in fact 
there are probably multiple options, there's probably a lot of gray area, there's probably a lot of distinction and subtlety in the choices that you have. I think that as humans we are particularly susceptible to the either or fallacy because it so closely mirrors what we expect from our language. This is called binary opposition. The Swiss linguist Ferdinand de Saussure noted that human language is constructed of all these binaries, that we define one thing by what it's not, that we um, see everything in these kind of pairs of opposites. So when we get to false in one thing, false in everything, falsus in uno, falsus in omnibus, we're overlapping a false dichotomy with the ad hominem fallacy. The ad hominem fallacy is like a character assault. It's a personal attack where someone takes the conversation away from the issue at hand and instead tries to use a flaw or aspect of someone's character as a way of dismissing their argument altogether. So you're not addressing the logic or idea head on, but you're basically shaming the person presenting the argument instead. So despite ad hominem and false dichotomy being seen as fallacies, it doesn't mean they do not run rampant in our culture in the way that we discuss things, we encounter these kinds of arguments all the time. That's perhaps why Somerville mentions in her piece uh, that this is a common way of life that environmentalists often have to face. She writes, This tension is familiar in the lives of most environmentalists. Some own cars, some still eat meat. The more famous, in our midst, regularly fly great distances to speak about the horrific impact of carbon emissions, such as the 53 pounds of CO2 released by their airplanes with each and every mile traveled. This hypocrisy is a delicate balancing act. It speaks to the seemingly inescapable reality of this North American machine we've built and which now runs our life. Now, this North American machine to which Somerville refers is probably capitalism and more broadly consumerism. For more on consumerism, I'd like to show you a clip from an excellent video essay by the School of Life on the history of consumerism. So the video takes us through philosophical and economic thinking uh, prior to, during, and after uh, the Industrial Revolution, when consumption actually became a part of human life, whereas before that we didn't really own anything. The clip is referring to Jean-Jacques Rousseau, a very prominent thinker. It truly appeared to be a choice between decadent consumption and wealth on the one hand, and virtuous restraint and poverty on the other. It was simply that Rousseau unusually preferred virtue to wealth. So again, we have a false dichotomy. We have this idea that is still to some extent in operation today that, um, and we see it in pop culture, you see it in that ever uh, present conflict between art and commerce, the idea of selling out, that there is a strict binary between being either wealthy and having a lot of stuff and being morally repugnant and um, not concerned with morals or ethics or high-mindedness versus being virtuously poor, right? It's like the chic of poverty um, or the virtue of poverty where you are selecting not to participate in this immoral consumption. So the less you have, the better a person you are, essentially. The video goes on to suggest that this either or option is not necessarily helpful or true. The one question that's rarely been asked is whether there might be a way to attenuate the dispiriting choice, to draw on the best aspects of consumerism on the one hand and high-mindedness on the other without suffering their worst sides, moral decadence and profound poverty. So anytime you're going all in or all out, 
there's going to be some kind of negative consequence. There's no one truly virtuous way of doing things. We can try our best, but it doesn't always work. I think that it is in trying to confront this false dichotomy of either participating in consumer culture or not participating in consumer culture and being good or hip or whatever it may be. Um, in our attempt to reconcile those two extremes, I think that's where we've gotten the birth of the conscious consumer. Right, so the person who can have uh, both worlds, who acknowledges the things that they gain from being a part of consumer society, even though it may have some drawbacks, um, but also attempts to make selections that will tip us toward a consumer society that is less focused on frivolous goods and more focused on services and using the value of the dollar to do good, to not do harm. Okay, so next I have what I think is a perfect example of the conflict between an old way of thinking of believing in either or of structural reality versus post-structural and the ability to exist um, as more than one thing at a time, particularly in regards to personal identity, is an example that's not actually about sustainability, but is about politics. So we have a counter argument proposed by the writer Lauren Duca, who is being challenged and kind of criticized in a sort of combination of ad hominem and false dichotomy that because she writes about pop culture, she cannot be respected for writing about politics. Here's her response. A and woman okay can love with... Ariana Grande and her thigh-high boots okay. and still I'm discuss just letting you know that I read you politics. a Teen Vogue I, as of today. And they're, those things are not mutually exclusive, you know? Right, so they're not mutually exclusive. You don't have to just be one thing or the other. You don't have to be sustainable 100% of the time or not at all. Sometimes you'll operate at 30%, sometimes 90%, who knows? But you don't have to be all or nothing. Being sustainable, an environmentalist, or not an environmentalist are not the only two options. I'd like us to break this cycle of shame that we fear from others for not being vegan enough or zero waste enough or for being a hypocrite for our daily lifestyle choices. Shame does us no good. When I was first starting my plastic free journey, I was experiencing my first month of trying to go plastic free. And I had a box that I was gonna go through at the end of the month in which I was collecting all of the pieces of plastic that I had used, you know, without wanting to, but that I would later have to figure out how to replace those or make substitutes, that kind of thing. And I am a little loath to admit, but I had put a label on this box and I called it the Hall of Shame. Luckily, my best friend in the universe uh, went behind my back and revised the sign for me. Here's a picture of it. She said, no, no, this is a hall of forgiveness. And shame is discussed beautifully by a researcher and storyteller, Brene Brown. If you haven't checked out her work, I strongly recommend it, especially The Gifts of Imperfection and Daring Greatly. Shame corrodes the very part of us that believes we are capable of change. You are imperfect. You are wired for struggle, but you are worthy of love and belonging. So just do something. Not everything, not nothing. Do something. My struggles include working toward veganism, zero waste, vintage and secondhand fashion, and self-care which I think is a form of sustainability as well. So I'd really love to see you around here on The Darling M. 
I'm Maggie. Have a lovely, forgiving day.